Well, good afternoon from Washington, D.C., and from wherever you're joining us and at whatever time, we welcome you to this program on North Korea and the Middle East, Lessons Learned from U.S.-North Korea Relations. My name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East-West Center, and it gives me great pleasure and delight to work with our colleagues at the National Committee on North Korea, headed by Keith Luce, to bring this extraordinary panel together to discuss these issues. Uh, you have all the details before you as part of this invitation, but I simply want to say that the East-West Center, which was congressionally established and authorized to promote relations between the United States and Asia, is always delighted to work with the National Committee on North Korea, including our joint website, North Korea and the World, and seminars on North Korea's external relationships. And in the spirit of bringing Americans and Asians together on a range of issues that affect global challenges and global connections, we're delighted to co-host this program. With that, welcome to all of you and over to Keith. Thank you for joining us. Dr. LeMay, Satu, thank you uh, for your comments. Uh, I also would like to echo on behalf of NCNK our appreciation at the work relationship we have with the East-West Center. And I would like to note for the audience, uh, we have a joint website called North Korea in the World which the East-West Center and NCNK originally established to point out North Korea's global connectivity and to provide information for researchers, policymakers, and so on. But NCNK itself, uh, we are an organization funded by American foundations and organizations. Uh, we promote principled engagement between the United States and North Korea. NCNK supports track twos involving Americans and North Koreans. NCNK also supports humanitarian organizations from the United States that work to provide life-saving assistance to the neediest of North Korea's citizens. And in addition, uh, just as through the North Korea in the World website, through our own website, through other information outlets, we work to inform policymakers and the public as a whole on a whole range of issues about North Korea. We have about 100 members, they are former US diplomats, uh, academics, humanitarian workers, nuclear scientists, and so on. But today we're taking a look at North Korea and the Middle East. This is a fascinating history. What can be learned about this history, about this experience? And how does the, the realities of North Korea and the Middle East, how do, how do those realities inform American approaches to resolving our own differences uh, with North Korea? Well, North Korea's roots in the Middle East are deep, going back decades. Interaction with countries in the region include on the military front, cooperation, training, uh, North Korean boots on the ground, shall we say, in the Middle East, sharing of technology, information on the nuclear and other WMD fronts. There's been extensive trade between North Korea and a number of Middle Eastern countries and the provision of North Korean workers as well. Uh, there are three countries of note uh, that for today's program, uh, Syria, Iran, and Egypt. Uh, these are three countries that are among those who've had the most interaction uh, with North Korea over time. From an American perspective, again, what we want to do is examine what has been learned about these relationships and how can these lessons inform US efforts to negotiate with North Korea and to come to a peaceful resolution of issues on the Korean Peninsula. We have today three stellar panelists with us. Uh, first, we have Suzanne DiMaggio. Suzanne is a senior fellow at the, Car at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she focuses on US foreign policy toward the Middle East and Asia. She's one of the foremost experts and practitioners of diplomatic dialogues with countries that have limited or no official relations with the United States especially Iran and North Korea. For nearly two decades, she has led these track 1.5 and track two conversations to help policymakers identify pathways for diplomatic progress on a range of issues, including regional security, nonproliferation, terrorism, and governance. Secondly, uh, we are pleased to have Yakov Katz with us. He's the Jerusalem Post Editor-in-Chief. He previously served for close to a decade as the paper's military reporter and defense analyst. He is the author of Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power, and co-author of two books, Weapon Wizards, 
how Israel became a high-tech military superpower and Israel versus Iran, the shadow war. In 2012 and 2013, Mr. Katz was a fellow at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University and was a faculty member at Harvard's Extension School where he taught an advanced course in journalism. We're also so pleased to have with us today, Dr. Siegfried Hecker, uh, Professor Emeritus in Research in the Department of Management Science and Engineering and a Senior Fellow Emeritus at the Freeman Spogli's Institute for International Studies. He was co-director of CSAC, Stanford University from 2007 to 2012, from 1986 to 1997. Uh, he served as the fifth director of the Los Alamos National Lab he is an internationally recognized expert in plutonium science, global threat reduction, and nuclear security. SIG is also someone uh, that I had the privilege of visiting the Yangbyon facility in North Korea on two occasions. He has been to North Korea several, several times. So with that, I want to first turn to Suzanne uh, for your remarks, your response to the topic of the day. What, what insight can you provide us? Thank you so much, Keith. Let me say hello to everyone joining us. And also let me thank NCNK and the East West Center for organizing this event today. Uh, my remarks are going to focus on diplomacy, the prospects for diplomacy with Pyongyang, and more specifically, what can we learn from the negotiations that led to the Iran nuclear deal and its implementation? I'll look um, to bring to the fore a few positive lessons as well as some negative lessons. Um, just to begin, some background on the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, it was signed in July, 2015. The agreement's only objective is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear bomb. It's an ambitious goal in and of itself, but it's not meant to cover Iran's missile program or its regional activities. The deal radically reduced Iran's uranium enrichment capacity, stretching break in, break, breakout time from three months to 12 months. It also illumin, eliminated the plutonium path to the bomb, and it placed Iran under the strongest nuclear inspection system ever negotiated. The real innovation of the deal is the unprecedented international verification provisions. In exchange for Tehran rolling back its nuclear program through these strict limits, the US and other world powers agreed to suspend some economic sanctions. At the same time, some sanctions related to other aspects of Iran's activities, human rights, terrorist financing, and missiles have remained in place. The deal also provided a direct, reliable channel of communication with the government of Iran which served at times as an early warning, de-escalation and crisis management channel. This is something we did not have for decades. Now, notably prior to becoming US Secretary of State, Tony Blinken authored an op-ed in the New York Times that referenced the Iran nuclear deal as a potential guide for North Korea. So that's what I wanna look at a bit today. Um, it's easy to dismiss such an assertion given how uh, different the two countries are. Having spent time in both countries, I can attest to the enormous significant differences firsthand. In terms of their nuclear files, an, a key obvious difference is that North Korea possesses nuclear uh, weapons, dozens of them, while Iran has never crossed that threshold. Also, Iran is a party to the NPT and the New North Koreans announced their withdrawal from the treaty back in 2003. We have a significant precedent of Tehran accepting intrusive inspections on a 24 seven basis, clearly not the case with Pyongyang. And of co course, both countries' regional contexts are dramatically different. Think Israel in the case of Iran versus China in the case of North Korea. Notwithstanding these differences, I believe the JCPOA experience can offer insights into how to pursue, how to begin engagement, with an adversary like North Korea, where the level of mistrust is enormously high, where sustained diplomacy could be an end goal. I'd like to put forward two elements, positive lessons to emulate. There are more, but I'll reduce it to two. The first is the value of quiet diplomacy. 
Uh, the foundation of the JCPOA was forged through discrete talks carried out by diplomats and negotiators who were empowered at the highest level to explore what's possible. This engagement track pursued by the Obama administration authorized US officials to participate in back channel diplomatic exchanges with their counterparts, and it was critical to the success of reaching a deal. This under the radar dialogue paved the way to formal negotiations within a broader uh, multilateral context, the P5 plus one. These discussions began in July, 2012 in Muscat with the Omani serving as a third party facilitator. And it provided opportunities to clarify expectations, intentions, identify common interests, areas of compromise, what the strict red lines were and so forth. Arguably, without these direct encounters, I don't think we would have ever reached a deal. The second element is an incremental approach. The road to the JCPOA was paved through realistic, achievable, step-by-step -step actions. First, there was an interim deal called the JPOA, the Joint Plan of Action. That was reached and then fully in implemented in order to build confidence. Then we moved on to the JCPOA. And if the US didn't withdraw from the deal in May 2018 and reimpose sanctions, there was a clear intention to build on it. This approach succeeded with Iran because the parties to the agreement demonstrated a serious willingness to use substantial leverage gained through a pressure track in the form of sanctions relief. The lifting of sanctions was tied to step-by-step -step actions by the Iranians and it worked. So how can we set a path to the kind of diplomacy that I just described um, with Iran and focus on North Korea? I believe to do this, the single most important task at hand is for the Biden administration to establish a sustained and reliable communications channel with Pyongyang. And rather than a public facing approach, a quiet diplomacy approach, uh, perhaps an intelligence channel or a secret back channel we have a precedent recently, the Trump administration established an intelligence channel with Pyongyang that preceded the diplomatic channel. Uh, key members of the Biden administration pursued a similar path with Iran when they served in the Obama administration that led to the two agreements, as I just described. They have a high comfort level with such approach and perhaps we shouldn't rule out that one has already been established. What should the Biden administration communicate for such a channel? Uh, we can discuss these possibilities later in our discussion if there's interest. For now, let me suggest beginning with a specific proposal, a proposal that places a peace regime uh, and denuclearization on equal footing would likely get the North Koreans attention. We already have the basis for such an approach, the 2018 Singapore Declaration. To take it a step further, I would aim talks at developing a framework for the normalization of relations. In any case, we need to get past the bland messaging that we have now, which is we'll meet the North Koreans anytime, any place, and so forth. Now for a reality check, and it's a very harsh one. Uh, since the Trump administration's withdrawal from the JCPOA in May 2018, the North Koreans have been drawing some negative lessons that will make the path to reaching any negotiated agreement far more difficult. The message they have taken from it is even if you abide by your commitments, the US can still renege and violate the terms of an agreement and the other parties won't do anything about it. You can make a deal with the US administration, but what happens when a new administration is elected? Keep in mind that the 1994 agreed framework with North Korea also fell victim to a US presidential transition from the Clinton administration to the Bush, Bush administration, although the circumstances were quite different. Then there's the issue of irreversible measures, which the North Koreans could be, would be concerned about. The US commitments outlined in the Iran deal were easy to reverse with the stroke of a pen as we witnessed, while the Iranians carried out commitments that can be viewed as irreversible such as disabling their plutonium facility in their Iraq. Uh, rebuilding it would require years and substantial funds. 
So following the Iranian experience, we should expect the North Koreans to be reluctant to take any similar steps that would be difficult to reverse. And following the US exit from the deal, we began to see a sharp increase in tit for tat provocations embroiling us in a dangerous escalatory ladder in the Middle East. The impact of the killing by the US of Qasem Soleimani, uh, commander of Iran's Quds Force, must weigh heavily on Kim Jong-un's mind. He likely saw it as a successful decapitation exercising, exercise, I should say, reinforcing the notion that the US is an existential threat to regime survival and advanced nuclear weapons and missiles are the only reliable means to deter such US aggression. So the US reneged on a sound functioning non-proliferation agreement with Iran. And even though this agreement was endorsed by a UN Security Council resolution, the remaining parties could not or would not do much to ensure that Iran received benefits for continuing to comply with the deal, which they did for one year. So how do we recover from such a miscalculation, an unforced error? Uh, we should assess how this will hap hamper our um, ability to conduct future diplomacy with adversaries, the toughest cases. A final negative lesson that I think the North Koreans might be drawing is that the Biden administration had a very small window of opportunity to de-escalate tensions, revitalize diplomacy, prior to Iran's presidential election in June 2020, 21, I should say, and they missed it. While the current administration certainly has no control over their predecessor's decision to withdraw from the deal, they had time to fix it and fix it quickly. Uh, well before inauguration day, this group uh, in office already knew very well that the array of plan B options were quite terrible yet they drag their feet. So we can aspire to craft similarly solid agreements like the JCPOA, but if they fall victim or fall prey to US domestic political infighting and presidential whims, how can we reassure leaders in countries such as North Korea that it's worth it? I think we need to think very hard about this. So just to conclude, um, whether we're talking about issues related to non-proliferation and disarmament with Pyongyang or Tehran, I think there's only one way forward, and that is to meet, to talk, to engage, the hard work of diplomacy and statecraft. This is especially so when the parties are long-term adversaries. We need to set realistic benchmarks like we did with the Iranians, meet them step-by-step, step, build trust over a sustained period of time and keep doing it uh, despite inevitable setbacks, even while maintaining a healthy grasp of the limits of the possible. There really are no shortcuts or substitutes. Thank you. Suzanne, thank you for those insights, uh, most informative. And uh, I should add, by the way, uh, in terms of the audience, if you have questions that you would like to pose uh, to the panelists, uh, please use the Q&A box. And later on in the program, I will be selecting as many questions as possible uh, for presentation to our panelists. Uh, next, I turn to uh, Mr. Kotz. Uh, Yakov wrote this book, Shadow Strike. I strongly recommend uh, reading it if you have not. Uh, Yakov, before you give your answer to the topic of the day, uh, why did you write the book? Tell us about that. Well, Keith, it's uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be with all of you. Uh, the book to me was, I wrote it uh, a few years ago because <clears throat> it came out in 2019, so two years ago, um, because it was a story that I felt had never been told in its entirety. It is a story not only of uh, Israel discovering and detecting a nuclear reactor that was being built covertly by this regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, together with help from North Korea, and that's what makes the connection and why, why I'm on this call and on this Zoom panel today. But uh, also because it is a, uh, a story about um, why Israel does 
those kind of things and how it takes action to preserve its continued existence and to eliminate threats that it perceives to be of an existential nature. It also talks to the intimate relationship between Israel and the United States and the sharing of intelligence and how that went down throughout the, uh, the story. And it, it had just never been told. It was one of these like little footnotes in history, but never got its proper place on like a bookshelf, like the one behind you, Keith. So I felt that, you know, that that bookshelf was a bit uh, empty without a book that told this story. And, and that's what prompted me to do it. I, I was a military reporter covering uh, the Israeli military at the time of the bombing back in September of 2007 and was completely intrigued by this story because the Israeli government was not saying anything. It wasn't telling what it had done. It wasn't admitting that it had attacked a nuclear reactor. And, and that's what made this story all the more fascinating. And then what added to it in the mystery was the North Korean involvement. So uh, with that, maybe I'll just zoom out for a moment and, and talk about North Korea. And I think Suzanne kind of touched upon this and so did you, Keith, uh, in, in your opening remarks of uh, the role that North Korea has played in the region, uh, the support that it has provided over the years to countries like Iran, like Syria, whether it's in ballistic missile development. And that was pretty much perceived until the discovery of the Al-Kibar nuclear reactor in, in 2007. Israel discovered that reactor in March of 2007 when it was able to get its hands on photographic evidence, <coughs> excuse me, that it downloaded from the computer of a Syrian nuclear scientist who was visiting Vienna at the time. Um, and they were able to get their hands on, on photos of a nuclear reactor that was being built in Syria and the kicker of this of these, this stash of photos was one that showed Ibrahim Otman, who is the, the director general of the Syrian Atomic Energy Commission back in 2007, standing for posing for a photo in front of the nuclear reactor that was being built in northeastern Syria, together with a man who looked Asian. And the Israeli agents at the Mossad, that's the Israeli equivalent of the CIA, were looking at this. This, this Asian man was wearing a blue tracksuit, kind of like picture an Adidas style or Nike style uh, sports outfit. And they, they're, why is there an Asian guy in Syria standing next to the Syrian nuclear chief scientist? And they run his photo through their databases and they come up with the photo of a man who sits around the table of what was then called the six party talks, right? That were taking place led by the United States and others to try to get North Korea to disarm and dismantle its nuclear program. His name was Chon Chibu, and he was the uh, head of Yongbyon Nuclear Reactor. Maybe uh, Dr. Hecker had met him uh, on some of his visits to uh, North Korea. I don't know, but that, that would be interesting to hear. Um, that, that is what set off, and I think that that added a whole new dimension to the nature of the threat that North Korea posed to a country like Israel. On the surface, what does Israel have anything to do with North Korea is a great question, right? We're so far away from one another. There's no territorial dispute. This isn't, uh, there's no religious dispute that you can talk of between the Jewish state and the country, North Korea. So, so what would Israel have with North Korea? But this is exactly it. It's, it's the support of these violent, oppressive regimes that are near Israel, which openly threaten Israel, whether it be Iran, Syria, and the likes. I, I will just add to it that the, uh, the story of the Syrian nuclear reactor, I think, um, even though it dates back to 2007, was a bad lesson for North Korea. And also for Iran, right? Uh, Iran, which is today very much in the headlines as we all watch what's happening in Vienna and whether there will be a return to the JCPOA in those talks that are taking place. Israel is doing what it can to try to influence the Biden administration to take a tougher stance in those talks with the Iranians, not to relieve all sanctions, to keep some in place, not to give them a complete return to the JCPOA, but to try to make a deal that would be stronger and potentially longer. But what we saw back in 2007 from an American perspective was here was an ally of the United States, in this case, Israel, that came to the Bush administration and brought hardcore concrete intelligence 
of an illicit nuclear reactor that was being built by a regime that was not favorable, neither definitely not to Israel, but also not to the United States at the time. Um, that intelligence, it was then verified by the CIA, by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And even though they had this smoking gun, reactor that had only one purpose, the purpose of developing a nuclear weapon, the Bush administration made a decision not to take military action against that nuclear reactor. And we know how the story ends, Israel ends up attacking it on September 6, 2007. But if you think for a moment, time as all this was happening, North Korea was in the process of negotiating with the Bush administration, with the world, about what would happen with its own nuclear uh, program. It had only months earlier tested for the first time a nuclear device back in October of 2006. And George W. Bush, the president, stood in the White House and gave a speech where he threatened North Korea if it were to continue to proceed, even using language of if we were to proliferate nuclear technology. Well, here it was found just a few months later to not only be proliferating to nuclear technology, to be doing the greatest act of nuclear proliferation known to mankind, building a nuclear reactor for another uh, regime in the Middle East. And what price did North Korea pay? Absolutely nothing. Later, after the reactor had been destroyed, U.S. diplomats met with their North Korean counterparts who were parties to the six-party talks and showed them these same images that I had mentioned that the Israeli Mossad had gotten its hands on months earlier. And there was no repercussion. Not only that, but fast forward a, a, a year, and uh, Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State, convinced the Bush administration to remove North Korea from the list of states that sponsor terrorism. They were then returned to that list by the Trump administration many years later. So I'm no expert on North Korea. Uh, I don't venture to be. But I, I do think that, you know, for the people who I did speak to about this book, well, definitely in the United States, but also in Israel, looked at this succession of events and saw this as a bad example, a bad lesson, not only for uh, Syria, which also did not pay a price. Yes, their reactor was destroyed, but that was it. They were not never sanctioned for what they did. You, the North Koreans were never punished. And uh, Iran, which was watching as all of this happens, also learned that the United States would probably never do anything against it. And therefore, it could continue with its own nuclear program. So I think that what happened back then definitely set the stage for a lot of what we're seeing playing out today. And you could even just go look at specifically North Korea in the years after, a couple of years after the discovery of the Al-Kibar reactor, they went ahead and tested a number of nuclear devices. Um, so this was not right. They, they learned a bad lesson. I think that unfortunately the Iranians also learned a very bad lesson that day. Thank you. Thank you, Yaka. Very interesting insight. And now we turn to Sig Hecker. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, thank you, Satru, uh, and to both organizations for hosting us. And it's such a great pleasure uh, to follow Suzanne uh, and, and Yaakov. Uh, so there are a lot of things I'd like to say, but given uh, the limited time, uh, a lot of things I'd like to say on Syria and, and the reactor, and perhaps we can touch on that later. Uh, what I thought I would do uh, based on my discussions with Keith is I would focus on the JCPOA and sort of the lessons learned in both direction. In other words, to sort of follow up uh, on Suzanne's. He did such a nice job uh, on the diplomacy end of things. You know, I'm a technical guy, and so you're gonna see a lot more technical aspects uh, come into the discussions and at least what, what my views are. So what I wanna do is quite quickly, I'll share uh, five, five different points with you uh, that I take away uh, from watching both North Korea and Iran for all of this time uh, over the last several decades. Uh, and the first one, the first lesson uh, from the JCPOA for North Korea. And Suzanne has, has really touched on that in greater detail. So I'll just say it briefly. You know, for Iran, the US sent the A-team. And the A-team was backed by a very engaged president, namely President Obama. Uh, for North Korea, that really didn't happen. Uh, so at the diplomatic level, we didn't have 
uh, the, the A-team. And even when we had very good diplomats, they had no backing uh, from their government. So the only A-team as such to high level came in the Trump-Kim personal diplomacy. Uh, and they did some really interesting things, but there the problem was they didn't have the lower levels with them. In other words, Pompeo and Bolton were constantly working against the Trump agenda. Uh, and so you had this problem that in the Obama administration, JCPOA, the administration had its act together. For North Korea, neither the Bush, the Obama, nor the Trump administrations really had its act together. The second part on negotiations, and this for me is a particularly important one, and that is for the JCPOA, uh, the political and technical aspects uh, of negotiations were fully integrated, uh, in fact, tightly integrated. Uh, for those of you who watched those proceedings, you know, when you saw uh, Secretary um, uh, John Kerry there, sitting at his left hand was none other than Secretary Ernie Moniz. And usually, of course, we say at the right hand of so-and-so, but it turns out John Kerry is left-handed. And so Ernie Moniz was sitting at his left hand. Ernie Moniz is a card-carrying nuclear physicist. He knows everything about nuclear physics. He was the Secretary of Energy. He had at his disposal uh, all the technical experts from the nuclear laboratories in the United States, and he used them, and he used them effectively. And, and so once the political decisions were made to go after the fissile materials for the Iran deal, uh, it was done perfectly in step between the technical uh, and the political. And, and in fact, I was out of uh, Los Alamos by, by that time, but I went back to Washington a couple of times at, at uh, Secretary Moniz's request, uh, to assess uh, some uh, of what he thought was going to come down uh, from the uh, Iran deal. So it, it was done superbly in North Korea. That's been totally missing all the way through. And in fact, every time when we came to key decision points, the technical aspects were never integrated into the political decision. They were strictly political whether it was ideology during the uh, Bush administration or whether during the Obama administration, it was this enormous distrust uh, of, of North Korea. So that was never integrated. That's been a major, major problem as far as I'm concerned. The third point, uh, on the Iran deal, the US was willing to take risks in order to make uh, progress. Uh, the risk here was to focus, uh, as Suzanne had said, on the fissile materials, the plutonium, uh, and uh, the enriched uranium. They were willing to take risks on the enriched uranium to allow uranium enrichment for low, uran for low, low enriched uranium for civilian nuclear programs. Uh, and uh, you know, I always like to say, being the technical guy, there are three requisites for a bomb. You have to have the fissile materials, plutonium or highly enriched uranium. Uh, you have to have weaponization that is designed, built, and test a nuclear weapon. And third, you have to deliver it. Well, the Iran deal was focused on the fissile materials part. They couldn't get the Iranians to budge on the missiles because there's this complication of conventional missiles you know, versus nuclear capable missiles. And on weaponization, it wasn't verifiable. Uh, and so they let go of that and focused on the, new, uh, on the nuclear materials. And in other words, you know, no plutonium, no highly enriched uranium, no bombs. Uh, and they wanted then to move Iran away from that uh, capability, which they did. So it took uh, uh, those uh, sort of risks, uh, and it also took the risks to have sunset clauses, you know, related to the amount of enrichment, what level uh, of uranium uh, enrichment could be done. So they had sunset clauses. However, what's never been fully stressed and needs to be stressed, Stress. There was no sunset clause on Iran not developing nuclear weapons. They said they would not develop nuclear weapons. And as I'll come back to at the end, you know, that really was not the case. But the administration was willing to take that risk for the case of North Korea in comparison. Again, none of the administrations, you know, neither the Bush administration, Obama, or the Trump administration were willing to take those risks. They wanted to drive the risk to zero instead of managing the risk. And so each time when they managed to get reasonably close, uh, then they backed away again. The fourth point is walking away. 
And this is a lesson that we should have learned for the Iran deal from North Korea. And that is, you better think hard before you walk away. You better look at the risks, both the technical and the political risks when you walk away. And here, the Bush walked away from the agreed framework. They opened the door for North Korea to build nuclear weapons. Obama walked away from a leap day deal. He opened the door that they probably had 25 by the time he went out of office. They walked, Trump walked away from Hanoi. Uh, and when he was all done, they probably had 45 or, or so nuclear weapons. And so in each of those cases, they did not fully assess the consequences of what it is to walk away. That's a lesson that should have been learned because when Trump walked away from the JCPOA, guess what happened? And you've heard it in the news recently. So instead of that breakout time for making enough highly enriched uranium for a bomb went from, uh, it was on the order of weeks when the, uh, the deal was signed, it went to a year and now it's back uh, to an order of weeks or so. Okay, so th those are the lessons at least that, that come to my mind. But the fifth point that I wanna stress, it's a lesson yet to be learned, uh, both for Iran uh, and for North Korea. And that is when you're ready to return to a deal, you must account and reflect the actual new realities that are on the ground. So in the case of Iran, for example, you know, for the deal, they said, we've never done nuclear weapons. There was no sunset clause that they're never gonna do nuclear weapons. The new reality on the ground, I mean, I knew, I knew Iran had done enough work to sort of have an option to be able to build the bomb. What I didn't know is what the Atomic Archive has shown. Those are the new realities on the ground. The new realities is that Iran had a nuclear weapons effort, a substantial nuclear weapons effort, not just to build a bomb, but to build a nuclear arsenal. You know, there are some indications that in 2003, that may have stopped my own view and the view of many others, it went underground. Uh, and then of course, the 2018 raid uh, by the Israeli Mossad that got the atomic archive that demonstrated how Iran indeed had a nuclear weapons program. So the new reality on the ground is you can't just go back to what we had before. They said they didn't have nuclear weapons and they'll never get nuclear weapons. Well, they had a nuclear weapons program. They got the 110,000 documents that the Israelis got out of there, only about 30 or so percent. Where are the rest? What about those facilities that the Iranians still won't allow the IAEA to go into. And so the lesson is, look, the Iran deal, in my opinion, was sort of the best that could be gotten at that time. One needs to get back to something that moves them away. However, take these new realities into account. Iran has to be willing to demonstrate it's willing to walk away and walk back from those. For North Korea, the reality that we learn is Look, we look at them now. They have, you know, perhaps by the time Biden goes out, they may have 65 nuclear weapons. They have ICBMs. They have hydrogen bombs. You're not going to get them back to CVID. You're not going to get them back to a Libya model. You're not going to get them back to give a full declaration up front. You have to do what Suzanne laid out. You have to take a step by step approach and move normalization and denuclearization, just that it was set at Singapore in parallel in order to be able to get there. Okay, I've taken more time than was allotted, uh, but I just wanted to make sure to get those points across. Thank you. Well, thanks to, uh, to all three for excellent presentations. Uh, in a moment, maybe uh, perhaps one of you has a question for, for another panelist, but uh, uh, I'd like to turn uh, in a few minutes to Yakov to talk about actually Egypt and North Korea, even though this is not in the nuclear uh, realm per se, but it's a fascinating relationship. Uh, it, it has had some serious implications for both countries along the way. But before we do that, Sig, uh, you mentioned the Libyan model. And uh, Sig, as you're aware, in recent years, uh, m US politicians from time to time will say, well, North Korea should adopt the Libya model and, and, and this will all work out. So, so Sig, 
what was the Libya model briefly and why is that not attractive to North Korea? Okay, so we have uh, sort of two views of the Libya model. My, my view of the Libya model, they didn't have much. It was easy for them to give up those few centrifuges. They weren't anywhere close to getting a bomb. So the Libya model is, not, is nothing that we really need to talk about. However, the person who has touted the Libya model is one John Bolton. Uh, and he just did again uh, last week in a seminar. The way that he views the Libya model is that Gaddafi made a strategic decision to give up his nuclear weapons program. And what he sees as the Libya model for North Korea is for North Korea to make a strategic decision to give up the nuclear weapons program and essentially turn everything over. That's not gonna happen. It's silly to even think of that. All right, uh, Yakov, any comments on SIG or Suzanne's presentations? And then what insight can you tell us about uh, Egypt and North well, Korea? Uh, I, 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 just to add to what SIG was talking about with regards to Iran, I mean, I, I, you know, uh, without repeating too much, but I do think that he voiced, he articulated very well, the concern that Israel has, right, when it comes to Iran as an example, and this return to the JCPOA is definitely talking about the seizure of the nuclear archive back in 2018 and the lessons, the information that was gleaned from that does lead very much to an assessment also here in, in Israel that the Iranians are pursuing a nuclear weapons capability. That, you know, we're all familiar probably now with the December 2007 NIE, the National Intelligence Estimate that came out by the United States, which basically declared that the Iranians back in 2003 had suspended their weapons program as well as the uranium enrichment program only to uh, renew the uranium enrichment in 2005, but not the weapons program. Uh, Israel argued with that NIE when it came out in 2007, and I think that the 2018 nuclear archives kind of showed that it might have been right, but this is this is very much the concern. When it comes to uh, Egypt and North Korea, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, with the statue of, uh, I think, the muzzle of an AK-47 that North Korea gave to Egypt uh, a number of years ago to commemorate the 1973 Yom Kippur War, as it's known here in Israel. It's called something different in, in Egypt, the October War, I think they refer to it. But uh, back in 1973, uh, North Korean pilots, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, fought alongside Egyptians. Some of them might have died in, in being shot down by Israeli Air Force pilots. But the relationship between Egypt and North Korea runs deep, and it, and it, and it goes back many years in history during the Mubarak period, while he was still in power. Um, still, and even under uh, Sisi in recent years, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in recent years, he's also maintained a very strong trade relationship between Egypt and North Korea. I think they're, Egypt might be the, the third largest importer of, uh, or the one of the, at least in the top five of uh, North Korean goods around the world. Um, is that something that's of concerning to Israel? It definitely is, right? Egypt is a very important uh, ally to the state of Israel and the peace treaty that was reached back in the ninth, late 1970s, early 80s. Camp David Accords was instrumental, is a pillar of stability for the Middle East. So to continue to see the Egyptians uh, in bed with a uh, rogue actor is not something that uh, makes people here overly happy. However, Sisi has also proven to be an important ally to Israel today in the combating of uh, uh, radical Islamic terror in the region and per serving as a, as a mediator between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And there's a lot of that happens under the surface between Israel and Egypt. So I, 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 I can't say that this is something that, it's not an issue that you hear about often in Israel, uh, North Korea and Egyptian ties. It's not something that has people concerned about Egypt. But uh, I think that Israel long ago recognized that many of its allies and countries that it does have relations with are countries that will have relations with other players that it doesn't have relations with. A perfect example is as we're speaking, the prime minister of Israel just landed in Bahrain, right? Uh, uh, Bahrain, a country in the Persian Gulf, right? They, they have relations with the Iranians, right? Uh, the United Arab Emirates has relations with the Iranians. And just a couple of weeks ago, the president of Israel was there. So. Uh, you, we, we have to recognize that this is a very dynamic region uh, in that not always, you know, is your friend not going to have friends that are not necessarily your adversary. All right, uh, Suzanne, you may have comments on uh, what uh, Yaakov or Sig uh, have shared, but, but also, Suzanne, during your opening remarks, uh, 
you talked about uh, beginning diplomatic engagement or between the United States and North Korea. Uh, what's your assessment of the Biden administration's uh, progress thus far? And uh, what do you see as the likelihood for raising North Korea more so on the administration's agenda? Great questions. Um, just a comment before I answer that your set of questions, Keith, and that is, um, I still think, notwithstanding everything uh, that's been said, that the changes on the ground are profound. I still believe it is in the U.S. interest to get back into the JCPOA uh, as soon as possible, and then try to pursue a stronger deal. Now, timing is a key issue for the Biden team. You know, they're pressing the Iranians to wrap up the Vienna talks in the coming weeks. And the worry is we're getting close to the point where the pace of their nuclear advances could prevent the recapturing of the um, deal's benefits. There's no question about that. As Sig mentioned, we're now weeks away from Iran having enough enriched uranium to fuel its first nuclear bomb. Um, so, uh, Getting back into the JCPOA as it is, what would it accomplish? Well, I think it could probably extend that breakout time uh, at least to six months, possibly nine. I'll defer to the experts on that, but uh, there's, we're not going to recapture 12 months, that much is clear. And uh, weaponization, of course, of that material would take far longer, maybe two years. So it's notable that CIA director Bill Burns recently said that our intelligence community doesn't see any evidence that Iran's supreme leader has made a decision to move to weaponize. This is very key. Iran has the know-how and could have the material soon to weaponize, but it really comes down to political decision-making. And that's really what I think we should be focusing on. So a reconstituted JCPOA would ensure months of warning before Iran could produce enough material for a bomb. It also would bring back the IAEA sweeping monitoring inspection powers. Um, and this could be helpful to ascertain whether Iran is making a covert dash for a nuclear weapon, but it would also place a strict limit on R&D related to enrichment, securing the future of the ARAC a reactor which the Chinese are working on and securing the return of the Fort Doe facility for civilian uses. So I think it's well worth the effort. Now getting to your set of questions, Keith, you know, the Biden administration's approach to North Korea has been one of offering unconditional talks. But when you look very closely, it really is what I would call strategic patience 2.0. Uh, the language we will meet anytime, anywhere. They're very consistent at all levels, but the fact is it hasn't resulted in any visible progress. So should we expect to see any adjustments from the Biden team, any course correction, especially given uh, the recent missile testing that they've been doing throughout January in particular? Probably not. I think the Biden team appears less than excited about pursuing a proactive approach to North Korea. The North Korea has been absent, nearly absent on the administration's foreign policy agenda. There's so many other issues continuing to occupy bandwidth. Those issues keep growing. Um, and they've been very reluctant to invest in a, a major diplomatic initiative that's going to require significant amounts of time, energy, political capital. And SIG is right. Uh, previous administrations haven't either. Um, it's too risky to go out on a limb. Uh, the chances for concrete progress remain minimal. Um, given the low odds of a positive outcome, it's not worth as, uh, it's not seen as worth the effort. Uh, there's potential negative political exposure in this year of, of midterm elections. And I think this team is especially hesitant to be seen as doling out incentives to get the North Koreans to the negotiating table. Um, so I'm not optimistic that there's going to be a change of course. Um, and also, when you look at the regional and global playing fields, they have changed dramatically since North Korean officials were engaging during the, during the uh, Trump administration. Uh, for the most part, for the Biden administration, 
North Korea is not seen as being part of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's not viewed as a prominent feature of the administration's approach to the, the Indo-Pacific, the outline of which was just released to very little fanfare last year, I think, nor uh, last week, I should say. I think North Korea only got a paragraph in the whole document. But as you know, Keith and Sig and others, the reality is, is that North Korea can turn on a dime and we may be seeing that now with all the missile launching um, and it can become a crisis situation rather quickly and given, given the ramped up missile launchings, we might be entering a fraught period again and we have very limited options. So uh, that's why I put forward the idea of a more focused, assertive, low key outreach, perhaps through a back channel uh, to start to talk seriously with the North Koreans about something specific. Well, Suzanne, I'm going to come back to you in a few minutes uh, and provide you an opportunity, should you uh, decide to take that opportunity, to be a little more specific about what the United States might offer or, or might outline in an approach to North Korea. The reason I bring this up is, uh, as you're aware, it takes two to negotiate. And uh, the North Koreans uh, since Hanoi uh, have really been unwilling to engage with the United States track one, track two. You have the North Korean leader who met with the president of the United States three times. He went home empty handed each time in terms of no sanctions relief, which uh, as we're all aware, really emboldened the hardliners around him. The moderates have sort of been pushed to the side. You then have the pandemic, you have the national security implications and concerns for North Korea with the pandemic, you have weather disasters, challenges to the economy and so on. And so if you're the leader of North Korea, given the fact that you met with the United States president three times, you brought nothing back home, uh, what incentive or incentives might be required to get Kim Jong-un to actually uh, come to the table? So we'll come back to you in a moment on that. I'd briefly like to throw out, uh, back to Syria uh, for a moment, um, and North Korea. Uh, Dr. Samuel Romani uh, spoke at a webinar hosted by the East West Center and, and NCNK several months ago. And uh, he has also written for 38 North. Uh, he's he's uh, posted quite a bit in terms of Syria and North Korea. Uh, in the East-West Center NCNK event, Dr. Romani stated that he sees the possibility during the post-pandemic era of North Korea becoming a surrogate for Russia and Iran, or, or North Korea doing bidding for Russia and Iran in Syria. So Yakov, what's your response to that? Well, I, I think that, you know, what we learned from the experience with nuclear reactors, exactly that, right, that the North Koreans play a dangerous role in the region, that is something that can't be ignored, right? So uh, I, I think that, you know, when the, war, when the U.S. tends to look at North Korea, it tends to look at it through the prism or the context of what is the threat that it poses to Asia, what is the threat that it could potentially pose to the continental United States if it were to get its hands on uh, an ICBM that has the ability to carry a nuclear warhead and be able to fly it across the Pacific towards the United States? Israel is not concerned of, of, of that happening, right? Israel doesn't fear that one day North Korea is going to lob a nuclear a missile at Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, but it does have uh, uh, a lot of concern about the proliferation of the technology that North Korea has mastered in sharing it with countries or not even non-state actors that could potentially use these weapons, right? I think that what we've seen in recent years is, you know, one of the problems, for example, with the JCPOA, which Suzanne was talking about at length, is that while, you know, a, a nuclear deal might be the best deal possible, it might be the best outcome possible, I tend to agree with that, right? Uh, a, a deal is better than war. But um, the deal that completely ignores Iran's ballistic missile development, a deal that completely ignores Iran's support of terrorist proxies throughout the region, whether it's the Houthis in Yemen, it's Islamic Jihad in Hamas, in the Gaza Strip, it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, and other non-state actors that are assembling uh, significant quantities 
of uh, advanced weaponry we've seen just what the Houthis in Yemen are capable of doing and the way they've been terrorizing airports, the airport in Abu Dhabi and, and sending drones over there. The, the, the Houthis don't have drones. They're getting them from the Iranians, right? The ballistic missiles that the, uh, the, the Hezbollah has been trying to get its hands on that came from Syria uh, in Syrian stockpiles during the civil war there were built on, uh, were, were the, the Scud D and Scud C missiles that the Syrians have were modeled after North Korean missiles, right? So uh, th th this is all connected to one another. We're looking at a nexus that is, it, you can't just ignore it. And I think that, you know, it, it, it's, it's tends, you know, people tend to be provincial and that's fine. And people look at what affects them and, and that's natural. But this is a threat I think that has, or it's a challenge of a much wider and greater magnitude. All right, thank you. Well, we are coming close to a uh, conclusion of the program, but before we uh, sign off, I want to turn first to Sig and then to Yaakov and then to Suzanne for final, uh, final remarks. You've already provided uh, your opinions about lessons learned. Uh, anything else you'd like to add in that context? Sig, you're first. Thank you. Uh, Syria. Well, let me just say a few words about Syria. And the fact is, uh, we need Yaakov to go back and write another book uh, about the uh, Syrian uh, reactor uh, because there, there are questions that still puzzle me immensely. The most important question is who was the customer for the plutonium that the Syrian reactor was going to make? You know, it's hard to think that Syria uh, would be the customer. They didn't have a reprocessing facility at least as of yet, so you can't get weapons grade uh, plutonium unless you have a reprocessing facility. They would have had to build one. They don't. Have, they didn't have the money to do all of this. So was it Syria? Probably not. Was it Iran? Quite possibly. And Hans Rühle, a, a former a, a German, um, uh, actually uh, from their uh, intel services, uh, he claims that it, it was Iran and that Iran actually paid for that reactor being built. I don't have any evidence to that. But we should find out if it was Iran, uh, then not only did we have the other problems with Iran, but we yet had a problem that they're gonna have plutonium make someplace else. Or was it actually North Korea itself that while as Yaakov uh, pointed out in 2007, uh, they actually uh, had uh, a, dis, uh, a disablement process going on North Korea nuclear facility. Were they then building the reactor to get plutonium for themselves a different way. Again, I, I don't think so, but we don't know. We don't know the answers to any of those questions. And as Yaakov had pointed out, it turns out for a number of reasons, the North Koreans managed to get away with that. The Syrians managed to get away with that. And that's something that our community needs to understand. So let me just leave it with that. Thank you, Sig. And uh, Sig, you know, we, we spoke of Yaakov's book, uh, Shadow Strike. I think you're working on a book, aren't you? Do you, do you have a title yet? I know it's uh, not, not published yet. <laughs> no, it is not published, but we're just in the last stages, you know, with the last uh, editing and probably won't uh, come out till uh, this fall. Uh, but at least at this point, uh, it's uh, my working title is Hinge Points because it points to all those times in the three US administrations where we had a chance and we went the wrong directions. And hinge points is when bad decisions have bad consequences. Of course, I'll add a byline to the hinge points, but that's the current thought. Thank you, Sig. Yaakov, final remarks? I, uh, I wish I had the answers to what Sig asked. Uh, th these were puzzling uh, questions that I put to people here in Israel. And, 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 and what I can tell you, and I think I mentioned this in the book, is that when it comes to the possibility of Iran, right? as you mentioned, maybe Iran was supposed to be the customer of the, of the plutonium, but you know, also like you mentioned, who paid for it, right? We, Syria does not, did not have money then, definitely doesn't have money now to be able to build up, a, build a nuclear reactor, pay the North Koreans who were presumably doing it uh, for money, which they definitely needed. Um, so how, where, where was where was Syria getting billion plus dollars, if not more? And and how did no one pay attention to this money that's being funneled out of Syria and going to North Korea, which led also to this theory that it might have been the Iranians who were paying for it. They might have been the customer. I, I can tell you from speaking, unless 
all of the intelligence officials who I spoke to, government officials who I spoke to, uh, were all in on uh, uh, the, 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 the ploy not to tell me the truth. I don't think that Israel really ever got to the bottom of it. And I think that that remains one of the mysteries of this relationship that we saw in the construction of the, what became known as the al Kibar nuclear reactor. Uh, it, it's a fascinating question. I don't know if we'll be able to have another book <laughs> that will come out of it, but it's definitely it's definitely a question that 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 I tend I still talk to people about because I don't think that we we still know the exact uh, relationship there, and that that can only lead me in, and with this I'll end to a continued concern of 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 what these types of relationships um, lead to, and also just a reminder to everyone that we know what we know. But there's a lot that we don't know, and that, that that pertains obviously also to what Iran is doing with its own nuclear program. And, and we can see what we can see, but whatever else might be out there is always going to be the big uh, challenge to discover. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Suzanne, last remarks. I'll be very brief since we're out of time, but I just wanted to go back to your the question you posed to me, Keith. What could be in a U.S. proposal to North Korea? Because you're right, they're not picking up the phone. But with COVID now subsiding a bit, uh, they're opening their borders a little bit. Maybe now is the time to pursue a, um, uh, an initiative with the North Koreans through some quiet diplomacy. I uh, already said something about a proposal that places a peace regime and denuclearization on equal footing. I think that would get their attention. And I think whether one thinks North Korea's denuclearization is an impossible goal, um, the Biden administration is not going to drop it. Domestically, it's just politically untenable for them to do it. But instead, they could reframe it as an end goal with a very ambiguous timeline. And let's get on with things. Uh, there are a lot of things to discuss. It's a far more realistic approach. Uh, talk about um, uh, fissile material and making sure that that does not get into the hands of others. We might envision a series of agreements, uh, perhaps focusing on halting of development of new warheads um, and long range missiles as first objectives. Uh, there are many other important goals to pursue with the North Koreans in the meantime. Uh, some might call this an arms control approach. Um, I don't think the Biden administration will ever go there. They'll never drop denuclearization. But I think we can frame a proposal that uh, helps get us at least to um, uh, a beginning. Thanks, Suzanne. And again, thanks to uh, each of our three panelists. Um, I would also like to express my gratitude today to my colleagues, uh, Esther M. and Marissa McPherson uh, for their assistance in putting this program together, uh, to Satu, uh, to, to Sarah Wang, Ross Tokala, Kimri Lynch with the East West Center. Um, so thanks, Satu, to you and your crew. And um, by the way, this is being recorded, will be posted on YouTube uh, through East West Center or NCNK. Satu, over to you. Well, there's really nothing for me to say except what an outstanding panel. And thanks so much for the cooperation, Keith, um, in hosting this program. We look forward to future engagement, of course, and we're working on a new series on North Korea's engagements internationally. And we hope to have those webinars in due course. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.